how hard can it be to build a pyramid? Oh. Hey there, I'm Sabrina and this is History Remade. In each episode, we deep dive on an iconic object in history and try to remake them using time accurate techniques and whatever I could find at my local craft store. Today, we're building the Great Pyramid of Giza. Located in Egypt, this testament to human engineering is the oldest of the seven wonders of the ancient world. How did they do it? Let's find out. All right, so before we build it today, I think it's worth knowing why they built it back then, because context is important, especially when that context was around 4,500 years ago. Like, I personally do not see the point in having a giant triangle for a gravestone. It seems excessive. However, the ancient Egyptians had slightly different priorities. Here's why we think the Egyptians built the pyramids. Our understanding of ancient Egyptian culture shows a fixation on the afterlife, and specifically how to have a good one. The things and the people you were buried near were expected to also appear in your afterlife, and if those were disturbed, so were you. So naturally, pharaohs filled their tombs with riches and protected them, and the nation was inclined to help either through civic duty or the utilization of slave labor, because pharaohs were believed to be the chosen representatives of the gods. Bad things happen to the people if bad things happen to the pharaoh, in this life or the next. Early Egyptian cultures sealed off underground tombs called mastabas, using large rectangular masses constructed from mud brick or stone. The first pyramid formed when Imhotep suggested stacking several mastabas for the tomb of the pharaoh Djoser in 2700 BC. Then, if we fast forward 200 years, techniques became more sophisticated, the nation became more prosperous, and the pharaohs more competitive. They sought to build pyramids more grand than their predecessors, a sentiment epitomized with the Great Pyramid of Giza. Commissioned by King Khufu, this is the largest Egyptian pyramid, standing 481 feet tall with a base of nearly 600,000 square feet. In other words, it's real big. And today we are going to build a perfect one-to-one -one replica. Uh, no. Why? Uh, oh, okay, I guess we're building a scale model. Every 40 feet will be represented by one inch, so our final pyramid should be about 19 by 19 inches at the base, or 0.2% of the true size. Less impressive, but let's do this. So with every build, we're gonna focus on exploring time-accurate techniques over time-accurate materials. That means that we're gonna be using things that you could grab at your local hardware or craft store. For this build, we're gonna be using the following. Organize. Where's the tarp? The sand. Cool. The process breaks down into four steps. Getting the blocks, moving the blocks to the site, building the pyramid core, and building the outer layer. So let's start with step one, getting the blocks. Now the core of the pyramid was made of limestone bedrock taken from a local quarry. As far as rocks go, limestone is pretty soft, which is fortunate since the ancient Egyptians had almost no access to strong iron tools. Instead, they used copper, a relatively soft metal that dulled quickly. To mine our little quarry of XPS foam, we're gonna be using a chisel scraper and a table knife. Just to really capture that, this is not the ideal tool for the job energy that the original build had. For how many blocks we need, I'm gonna whip out my handy dandy little calculator. I assume this scales linearly, right? I'll be honest, I've got no idea what you did what you mean there. When was the last time you had to do math? I don't remember calculus. Is that what you're asking me to do right now? I don't even know if it's calculus. Let's just assume it scales linearly. 0.02 times the scale of the true pyramid, which used like two million-ish blocks. Yeah, we just we just need to cut out 4,000 tiny little blocks from, that sounds feasible. We have a day to do this, right? We can do it. Now the ancient Egyptians didn't cut all of their blocks before they started building. It was more of a set of parallel processes, but there's only one of me, so I'm just gonna do it all in advance. Back in the day, they would exploit the natural layering in limestone by splitting it and then sawing it down to size. I'm just gonna use a ruler and split it with the chisel and then saw it with the knife. How did they do this with actual rock? Clean break. And then we just need to saw it down to size. Here we go. We got one brick. 
just 3,999 more to go. Oh, yeah. I'm losing the will to do this, Melissa. I think that might be what we need to do. You guys get the idea. They did this. They just had more time to do it. I regret this immediately. The blocks that made up the core of the pyramid range between two to 15 tons since the blocks got smaller the higher up they were on the pyramid. So here is an average big size block and uh, here's an average small one. Now that I have all my blocks and I do mean all my blocks, let's move on to step two, moving the blocks to the site. So we've got all of our blocks here and we need to move them over here. Now at this point, the ancient Egyptians didn't have knowledge of pulleys or wheels, so they dragged the blocks on wooden sleds, or in our case, popsicle sticks. Now there's just one problem. Sand. So there is a lot of friction between the sand and this heavy sled. Remember, these are supposed to be like 15 tons each. Now, because of that, as it moved forward, sand would build up in front of the sled. This would make the sled heavier and also eventually block the path. To fix this, they used water. It's just beep, beep, back it up, back it up, get that sand off there. I'm just gonna wet my sand, don't mind me. So the cool part about this is that this wet sand formed this slicker surface that not only reduced the friction to make it easier to travel across, but also notice that there's less buildup. Now this helped free up laborers from spending so much time and energy just moving the blocks to instead focus on step three, building the core of the pyramid. Now this is where things get wild. I went ahead and got a nice base layer of bricks set up, but the pyramid builds upwards, like. 481 feet upward, or about 12 inches with our scale. How would they get the blocks up there without pulleys or superhuman strength? Now, the most likely theory suggests two kinds of ramps were used. Let me show you. So here's a cardboard pyramid to give you an idea of like what the whole thing would look like and how these ramps would fit in. Melissa, can you pass me some ramps? Thank you. Ooh, they're still wet. <laughs> On the lower levels of the pyramid, a single shallow ramp could have been used to help push the bricks up. Now, the problem is, is that this ramp would either need to get incredibly long to maintain a shallow slope, or it would get too steep, and then you might as well be pushing it up the side of the pyramid eventually. So, after they reached a certain point, they switched over to a second type of ramp, a spiral ramp that moved around the pyramid. Now, what the ramps were actually made of is up to debate. It could have been stone or rubble or something like that. But regardless, their surface was likely not ideal for dragging. So there are a few theories for how they move the blocks up the ramp, and I'm going to share my favorite because it is possibly the coolest mechanic that I have ever heard of. They use these quarter cycle tracks to roll the blocks up the ramp. Let me explain. Now you need to know that rolling is generally better than dragging because the reduced points of contact mean less friction to fight against. However, if you wanna roll a block like this, like you gotta push downwards, it suddenly drops, you need to push upwards, and so on and so forth. It's really uneven and really inefficient. Now with these quarter cycle tracks, you'll see that that movement is largely reduced. You can actually use a relatively uniform source of energy and power to push the block up. And see, it kind of rolls. Now this is just a popular theory for how ancient Egyptians moved so many blocks around large distances. If there was any tighter spaces where the tracks couldn't fit correctly, then the block was lifted onto rollers, rolled about, and then used the lever to push it into its final place in the structure. Neat, right? Now let's do this with our actual pyramid, shall we? Wow. Nice. I do think that was cool. Now we just need to do this like 500 more times. This was so much harder than I thought it would be. Anyway, now that we're a fair ways through the pyramid, let's take a break and talk about 
the inside. Even though the structure is mostly rock, there are a few rooms, specifically the Grand Gallery, the Queen's Chamber, and the King's Chamber. There are also shafts connecting these chambers to each other and to the edges of the pyramid, but some of the design choices here are kinda whack. There's this seemingly random two-foot drop before the entrance of the Queen's Chamber. There are some air shafts that are sealed over so they don't actually allow air in. And finally, the King's Chamber has this little quirk. So it has these relieving chambers, these five cavities above the room formed with granite instead of limestone, or in our case, very wetly painted XPS foam. Granite is harder than limestone and combining that with the cavities in place, it's kind of assumed that they acted as a way to redistribute the weight of the pyramid above the king's chamber to protect it. Now, we don't know for sure, but that's kind of the best guess that we have. Now, if we wanna actually be true to the scale that we're using, it won't look like this. It'll look a little bit more like this. So we're just gonna... That, that should give you an idea of how much of the pyramid is rock versus room. We should finish building this. It's day two. Coming at you with a weird energy today, because I spent all of last night just dreaming about bricks. Should stop waving the knife around. Anyway, let's move on to step four, building the outer layer. So believe it or not, the Great Pyramid was completely smooth on the surface. Like you would slide down, you would probably die, but it is feasible. This is because on top of this core, white limestone blocks were added. Now this white limestone was from a different quarry, but it was really worth it because it would create this beautiful glistening finish. They would start at the top of the pyramid and work their way down, disassembling the ramp in the process. Now they would fill in the steps using that white limestone, cut it at the appropriate angle, and smooth it out. Now, to get our pyramid looking a little less pink and a little more pyramid-y, I did a quick paint job. I primed with a black sealant that had a little more fumes than our ventilation could handle. And after that dried, I just went over with beige and white paint to mimic the limestone. At the very top, there was this capstone covered in beautiful gold leaf to reflect the sun, which ancient Egyptians were very into. And with that, we have the Great Pyramid of Giza remade. Woo! Woo! Thank you. Okay, so the true build for this thing took 10,000 laborers in about 23 years. They had to make up a whole new city in Egypt just to house them. Now this model right here took me and my crew over 12 hours. And I don't know if it's because of the exhaustion, the paint fumes, the foam dust, but I love it. I've always found that the pyramids were interesting because they're so grand, right? This is a decent size, but it is only 0.2% of the true scale. However, after working on this and learning about the historical context, the minutia of the mechanics and rebuilding it brick by brick, it made me appreciate them in this, in this whole new light. And I think it's because there's just something remarkably human about the pyramids. Just the craftsmanship and the sheer effort involved in finishing something that is way too big to only have three tiny rooms in it, but they did it. And it's somewhat fitting that this pyramid has lasted for over 4,500 years. It's inspired countless theories and dreams and stories, and it doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon. Because as they say, the kings, like all of us, feared time. But time fears the pyramids and the sheer scope of human ambition. Hey, you wanna know a secret? I'll tell you if you comment down below with whatever build you think we should try next, and you do the whole shtick, the like, comment, share, subscribe, all that. Doing that? Okay, I'm trusting you with my big secret. Don't tell anyone. See you next time.